Welcome to Mysterious Goings On. We're going to get right to the show after these messages. You know, I love podcasting. I have since 2006, back when you had to use like a Dixie cup with string to make the thing work. And that's why I'm so excited that we recently moved Mysterious Goings On to Anchor FM to record our podcast. I got to tell you, I don't regret it a bit. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Not going to lie to you, when I first heard about Anchor, I was a little dubious because I've been doing it the hard way for so long. But I got to tell you, it's very easy. Use a Stripe account get sponsors you're not paying monthly hosting fees the sound quality is great the distribution is phenomenal friends download the free anchor app today if you want to start your own podcast or go to anchor.fm to get started remember you heard it here first on mysterious goings on You know, there's no sorcery in having an open heart. And if that doesn't make any sense to you whatsoever, it doesn't to me either, but actually kind of does. And I'll tell you why, because we've got a guest today who writes a lot of fantasy stuff and it, it looks brill and he's just got a great way about him, but he's also very open hearted to some people who are near and dear to me and probably to you if you're a regular listener to this show. He's Richie Billings and he's a billing and he is a writer, editor and marketer from Liverpool, UK. Um, He's had over a dozen short stories published along with a fantasy novel, Pariah's Lament, which comes out on 17th of March this year. So by the time you're hearing this, it's out. Go get it. Links in the show notes. He works for a leading digital marketing firm and applies everything he learns in uh, uh, his work uh, to help uh, with uh, with book and, and author marketing. And I think you're going to find out, too, that he's a very open-hearted individual because if you go to his website, link in the show note, you're going to see that he has all kinds of goodies and encouraging things for writers. And that's... That's why I started this podcast. So, Richie Billing, thanks for joining us here on Mysterious Goings On. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Alex. It's lovely to be here. You, um, yeah, so you're like me. I mean, I'm a day job PR marketing guy, so I write a lot of content. And um, But, uh, you know, my true love is fiction. I write mystery thrillers, and you write the fantasy stuff. And um, But you, uh, you just have this... Um, I, forgive me if I'm misreading it, but I don't know how I could look at your website, but you just really do have this open-hearted, everybody's, we're all in this together kind of approach to, to writing and other writers. Yeah, I think I have a philosophy um, that it, that is based around, every. I think everybody should write. Um, and even if you're not writing fiction or you're writing to get published or whatever, it's just a therapeutic process. It helps you reflect on thoughts, helps you organize thoughts in your mind. And I've just always found it really, really beneficial. And when I came into writing probably about five or six years ago, it just it just gave me so uh, like a complete sense of purpose. And ever since then, I've just been really content and happy with my life, even if I'm not making money, which you don't in writing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, I've, uh, you just do it purely for the love. And I... Um, I always remember quite vividly how, how much I struggled when I first started writing, particularly fantasy, because it's it's I think it's a little bit more challenging to other genres, particularly if if you're writing like a high fantasy, because you have to create a whole new world from scratch. You've got to there's no sort of real world references that you can make. Everything's got to be from scratch, so it can be a bit mind boggling. And yeah, I just wanted to make that process as easy as possible for other people. Um, Because if I've experienced these things, there's no doubt other people have as well. I'm sure that's part of the philosophy behind what you do as well. 
It is. It's interesting you say that too, because my hat's off to you uh, with uh, the fantasy, because you're right. If you think about, um, like I do mystery thrillers, well, everybody understands in the context, as long as I'm not doing them uh, way back in the past that of a place that never existed or so far in the future that there's no frame of reference, but everybody knows what a gun is. Everybody knows what a detective is. Everybody has a general idea. Or what if you're Star Trek, for example, you know, even yeah. though it was in the future, everybody knew a phaser was a weapon. Okay. So you didn't have to really explain. You just said, this is obviously a weapon or a tricorder. It analyzes things. Fantasy world though, who in the 21st century has a frame of reference for something that's thousands of years in the past um, and yeah. completely set in a world where, and does, and I got to ask you this real quick, does fantasy necessarily mean that there is magic or sorcery or can fantasy just be completely devoid of that aspect? Well, I like to write fantasy that's devoid of that aspect completely. Uh, I, I like human stories, but I like the freedom that a fantasy world gives you. There's no limit to what you can do. It's always about the escapism for me. So if I can create another world for people to go and explore while focusing on and exploring real world issues that, that are relatable and um, that's that's what i like to write about so for eyes the men for example you'd probably class that as a low fantasy and um, because there's no magic as such there's always a sort of um, a reference to it in the background but in this particular story it's all about people and the flaws of, of humanity and that's what i like to explore more than anything it's like what makes people do things um the good the, the good versus evil um, the more trope in fantasy is is the most common one, and that's what I love because it, we really get into the heart of what makes people tick and why they do certain things. Like why 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 does someone who is evil or what we perceive to be evil why do they believe that what they're doing is right? Um, that's something that fascinates me really, and it's just a matter of perspective. But I mean, I, I think it's becoming more and more accepted and understood even beyond writers, but by audiences that that if you write good characters, even the bad guy, so to speak, doesn't believe they're a bad guy. They yeah. just are going about their life. They are the hero in their own novel, right? I mean, yeah. um, the, the villain is just at cross purposes with the protagonist for whatever reason. Yeah, I totally agree. And there's been some brilliant books over the years that have, have really skewed the traditional villain or antagonist um, trope. So I've recently read a book by John Gardner uh, called Grendel. I don't know if you've ever, ever read that. Uh, it's about, it's a retelling of famous ancient English poem called Beowulf. You've probably heard uh -huh. of that, the film. Um, I think it has a uh, Ray Winston in <laughs> Oh um, my gosh! That, well, I I did have to read Beowulf in the in the middle school, so I I have yeah. read it though, so, yeah. But I haven't yeah, seen the so, movie. So Grendel is the the antagonist in Beowulf, and John Gardner rewrote Beowulf book from Grendel's perspective, and that was it was the his most famous book, and I think it was just because it was so unique, and I, I think when in our life there's nobody perfect, uh, right. nobody purely good. Nobody's purely evil. I think we all sort of live in that sort of gray area in between. Some things we do are probably good, some probably bad. Um, and I just sort of acknowledge the fact that we're all sort of drifting in and out of the good and the bad. Nobody's perfect. Um, so I like to explore that really, the sort of the limbo zone between good and evil. I do too. I, I find it much more interesting. Yeah, you know, the the mustache twirling villain uh, gets yeah. tedious very quickly i think to to readers tell us about pariah's lament tell us about this what is this story so it's an underdog story and and uh, when i was tasked with writing a novel I was, I, the, first, the first thing i did was have a think about the novels that i've loved and what is the key element that has has really married me to that story and made me finish it because i am to be totally honest, a terrible reader. I will read the first 10, 20 pages, and if I'm not hooked, I won't finish that book. I'm <laughs> terrible. I am I'm really bad. Um, <laughs> so when Pariah's Lament, it was like, I've got to start with characters, and I love underdog stories. I love the heroic moments, the sort of defy the odds. 
So I just wanted to write that kind of story. It's the the kind of fantasy story I want. I want. I like reading. So write the story you want to read is what they say. And uh, Pariah's Lament follows two characters, both outsiders, both underdogs, but they're at the opposite ends of the social spectrum. So it uh, follows one character called Edvar, who's thrown into the midst of a, a political war. And he, he's naive and young and inexperienced, and he's got to try and solve this massive problem out um, whilst dealing with his own demons as well. And uh, On the other side, we've got Izzy, who's... Uh, she was born with a birthmark on her face and as a result she's ostracized and alienated from society she's branded the cursed one uh, everyone hates her even her, her own father like beats her up and hates her living guts and stuff like that so she um is at the very very bottom of the sort of she's at the, the bottom of the barrel she she hates her life she's not to live for and she gets caught up in this political turmoil that's happening in the nation and ends up helping a forgotten race of people who effectively kidnap her in order to, to gain her help. And the story just goes from there. It's all about these two characters navigating what is going, the events that are happening in the uh, in in the kingdom, and it just ends up being a bit of a uh, a, a medieval warfare kind of fantasy so if you like lots of action lots of battles um and, and characters defying the odds this is what pariah's lament's all about i i love how you did this you made her um through no fault of her own she is an underdog simply because of birth uh there's a birthmark there is that is that she had no control over it, it and it shouldn't matter but of course in this setting it does and yeah. uh, she and edvar joined forces I, I love this aspect, and I like I like the joining forces aspect of this too. It looks uh, it looks like a fun journey, and uh, I'm looking at a lot of the reviews and uh, praise you get for this. And uh, 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 one reviewer said a tale of acceptance and confidence with breathtaking world building, which we talked yeah. about how you're doing world building, right? Um, the yeah. character journeys are incredibly well constructed. This is see that they are just actually buttressing your comments from earlier about how you like to write. <laughs> I like to build a world and I like good characters. Billy yeah. shrewdly delves into the very relatable human need to actualize and belong. This is great stuff here. Is it, uh, is it a, uh, a world that will continue beyond uh, the lament here? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Uh, an interesting set, to be honest, because my bubble share champion something called a shared universe so we've created uh myself and four other writers three other writers i've created a world in which we build together so it's a bit of an interesting concept uh it makes the world building a little bit trickier because you've got to fit it in with everybody else's um right. but it also makes it a lot easier because you don't have to do as much <laughs> so <laughs> Well, and, um, what we basically do is there's a, a time period of, say, about 10,000 years, and we each write, populate this this period of time in this world with all different stories, and then we try and weave our stories together. Um, so, yeah, it can be a bit frustrating because you might come up with an idea you really love, and then you propose it, and someone turns around and says, well, that doesn't work with my world or my story or whatever, or something that I've created. So it's quite an interesting approach, and it's something that has, has caused people's imagination. Um, because yeah. if if they read my book and they really like that kind of world, they can they don't have to wait until I write another book. They can go off and and read someone else's book set in the same world. There might be some references to my book or the places that uh, my story takes place in. So it's uh, it's really interesting to be honest. And um, yeah, it's a, I think it, it, I could say catching on. It's not something that I see very often. It is, but and I love that, that idea. And it, it takes a, it takes a special kind of author, by the way, to do that. I think there's a lot of authors who are very not precious, but very uh, proprietary about their their characters in the world. So let me ask you this though: uh, everybody creates an aspect of the world that's theirs, but do the other authors do they have Issy and Edvar in their books, or are they or are they just you know, part of it in the background, or do they have a cameo appearance, or are they all, are these the characters for the whole series? At the moment, um, there hasn't been 
a great deal of overlap just because everyone is writing in different time periods. There's a bit of overlap with one of uh, the other writers in my story. And I think we're going to try and link some of my characters into his story. Um, so mm. that remains to be seen. I haven't really in, uh, in, intertwined anyone else's stories into mine too much. But I think as we produce more stories, more content, it will flesh itself out. There'll be a lot more links um, to other people's works. And I think it'll be a really enjoyable experience for a, a lot of readers. Well, you know, uh, I have a fellow author and we just did little, we did it, we call them Easter eggs. We did a little Easter egg in each other's book. It's not anything more than a thin tendril, yeah. uh, tenuous bond between my world and his book's world. And uh, 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 sharp-eyed readers, one or two have caught it and they, del they, they and it's delightful for them. I think readers love yeah. that stuff. Um, you see that now, uh, if you're, if you're into the Marvel universe movies, I mean, they're, everybody's got, everybody's in, there's different characters, like it may be uh, the Iron Man movie, but at the very end, you might see Samuel Jackson's character. You might. So I think, I think, do you think at least, I'm asking what you think, but do you think that that is uh, a faddish thing to do, like a fad that will go away? Or do you think it's something that uh, will just keep going? People will want to see those little, little intersections. Yeah, I personally love those little details as well. So the idea of putting at least the eggs and stories is, is fantastic. So I, I think a lot of people really enjoy it. And particularly if you challenge readers to go out and find them. It's like when you play a computer game, like you see, I always used to play Halo. I know it used oh, to yeah. be um, like little things you could go and find on the maps. And I'd be obsessed with going to find these things. And loads of people love that kind of thing. It's just applying the same principle, but to writing. And I, not everyone's going to pick up on it because people read for different reasons and people True. read in different ways. But there's no harm in putting these little extra details in. I don't think at all. And for those readers who get a lot of satisfaction out of it, it's so worth it. I, I also did one thing in my second book. I, I put about a dozen direct lifts from famous movies in the mouths of our characters. And, you know, uh, just mm -hmm. one, there was, there was a, my lead character is being chased by somebody in a boat. And yeah. I went back to, uh, um, I went back to uh, Robert Redford and uh, Paul Newman's Butch and Sundance film, you know, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Yeah. And when they're being chased by the, the the posse at the end, they keep saying, who are those guys? You know, yeah. so I put that line in there and then later uh, they're getting closer and closer. And then, of course, I, I couldn't resist saying, I think we're going to need a, a faster boat instead of a bigger boat, which is out of Jaws. But I, but I, but readers tell me that they say, that's oh, good. that's so corny. But I laughed out loud when I read it and I kept reading. Yeah. So there you go right there. Right. You keep their attention, as you said, because if I want to keep Richie Billing attention yeah, and beyond 20 pages, I'm going to throw in an Easter egg, I think, in the first 20 pages. I'm going to have to do that, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be buying the whole series. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's. This is fascinating. I love this. Let me talk about what you're doing with your website. I love this, folks. You got to check this out. It's richiebilling.com. There'll be a link in the show notes. Um, what what I love here, he does something. I'm talking to them now, Richie. Pardon me. I'm going to talk yeah. to the listener directly. He does something here that is so generous and open-hearted he's got a hundred plus book reviewers list free for the asking go get it you know and he tells you how to pitch um uh these reviewers you know gives solid advice don't just send them your book without asking pitch them tell them what you're doing make sure you are not pitching a, a romance book to somebody who only does fantasy right don't don't yeah. do those kind of rookie mistake things that'll get you kind of crossed off the list by some of these folks because if they're a good reviewer at all they're yeah. inundated probably, right? With lots of books, Most wouldn't you say? Yeah. Definitely. I think book review in, in particular, when I was promoting Parai's Lament, it's such a, when you find the reviews, it can be quite tedious. It's definitely a numbers game. And it's purely yeah. for the fact that you said these poor book reviewers are absolutely swamped. You must never, ever uh, imagine a day when the inbox is, is clear of <laughs> email. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's just completely well, inundated. Um, well, so hey, it's, it's like it's. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. So I, I was just going to say, it's just you really do have to sell your work. You've got to make yourself stand out, and like you say, pitching. Um, like I, I have little jokes about 
like in the subject line of the email, like I'll say, oh, not another book review request. So like things like that, just to make yourself stand out a bit more because you just want. And I where I do a bit of work for the publisher and review email um, submissions and things like that. And it's just that the email inbox is just littered with the same subject, the same line. And you need something that will help you stand out that is going to make that person think, oh, that looks quite interesting. I'll click on that. So yeah, book reviews. That is that there's a, a detailed list on there, but it's definitely in need of updating. So that's something I do have. I think it's a hundred book reviews at the moment. I think I've got an extra hundred and fifty to add to that list. Oh, so well, I, I you know, and I was, <laughs> and I was, but well, see, there, your work is never complete if you're you're doing this. But I I, I was uh, cheered to see that some of these also do mystery thriller, which is what I write because I was thinking, oh, a book review. Then it's like fantasy only. I thought, uh, oh no, but there's mystery thriller on here as well because uh, I'm gearing up for my my push. My book's coming out in nice. Halloween. And okay. I need to, I'm getting everything lined up and pre-orders and all that stuff. And it's, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's fun. Yeah. And I appreciate this list. I went ahead and signed up for your email list. Thank you very much. And when you oh, sign up that. for this, yeah, you sign up for this, you get a free copy of his book on writing, his thoughts, we call thoughts on writing and his collection of published short stories flying on the ground, which I love that title, by the way, that's yeah. really great. Any Neil Young um, fans will get that one. <laughs> there you go. So t tell me though, w w there's so many more. There's a whole tab here on writing tools, uh, fantasy publishers, fantasy magazines and journals. I mean, this is like, folks, if you're a noob writer, if you're new, you know, the, these, these writers markets, you know, they sell these or they used to at least. And uh, here's Richie giving you kind of the kind of at least a very good start, if nothing else. So was this just was this something you did straight away when you first started and got the website set up? Or was it something you, after your travails as a writer said, I want to give people the things I maybe didn't have. How did you, how did you come about this very open hearted approach? Yeah, it's definitely um, tied to what you said at the end there. I, I was going through all these things. I was spending hours and hours and hours on Google looking for publishers for magazines and whatnot. Um, so I was putting lists together of the places that I'd submitted stories to. So I was like, this doesn't make any sense. Why am I just keeping this information to myself? Why aren't I sharing it with everybody else? Because there's no doubt other people who have experienced what I've I've gone through. And you just don't, you want to save them the time and the effort. And now you want to save people the money because there are paid services that you can go on, um, like Duotrope, which I have to say Duotrope. I subscribe to Duotrope. It's great. Um, oh, yeah? Oh, we should yeah, check that out. Yeah, you can find agents on there, publishers for ma magazines, um, for novels, everything like can you novellas. Spell that? Yeah, it's can you spell D that for us? Yeah, D U O T R O P E dot com. Okay. And you get a free yeah. 30 day trial. So hmm. if you've got a short story that you want to get out there or a novel, head on there and just have a check. You can loads of the really good filtration process. You. Publishers advertise on that uh, website themselves. So anyone who's listed on there is open and looking for submissions. Mm. Um, so it is, I think it's like $5 a month, which is, if you if you use wow. it a lot, it's well worth it. Yeah. Um, I, see, there you go again, just offering all this wonderful uh, <laughs> advice and help to people. That's so great. Um, I love that. Is this also, uh, you You write, your podcast is the Fantasy Writer's Toolshed. Is, is that more of the same? Is it plenty of writing tips and uh, tricks and help and advice? Yeah. What, what's that? What, what goes on on this show of yours? Yeah, it's, it's pretty much that. So I, probably two or three years ago now, I, I put together a book called the Fantasy Writer's Handbook. And this is just a collection of all the things that I've learned over the years about how to write a fantasy novel. Um, and so it looks at everything from world building to creating characters. To be honest, a lot of the book is just general story writing advice that I've learned from other writers over the years. Um, it's Some of it is, is like my own thoughts and ideas, but it's generally things that I've learned from much better writers than me. <laughs> So like Henry Gibson, um, Lejos Igri is probably one of my my favorite teachers. I uh, wrote a book called The Art of Dramatic Writing, which it just it just made so much sense to me after reading that book. And um, that was the turning point for me, I think, reading that book. <laughs> so <laughs> I just talk about what I've learned and that's how it came about. And then 
what I tend to do as well when I get time is carry out a bit of research. Um, I think I've, I've carried that over from university days, the academic days. Um, I've, I've asked just after just polls, researching people, uh, asking what the, what the thoughts, the feelings are on different things. So for a fantasy writer's handbook, I structured the whole book around one question, which was, what is the biggest reason why you stop reading a book? Um, uh, because I think that's it's it can be quite difficult to pinpoint why you like a book sometimes. I mean, you might say characters and things like that, but sometimes you just like it and you don't really know why. But you, when you don't like a book, you, there's a, you can pretty much guarantee there's a definite reason why you don't like it. Say, oh, I couldn't get into that. Too slow. Characters were all over the place. So I've I carried out quite a bit of research, which you can read on a uh, website. And a fancy writer's handbook just is structured um, around that research. So um, as a result of the feedback I got from writing that book, people were saying you should do more and different different formats. So I decided to give podcasts an a go because it's all the rage nowadays. <laughs> I, I really enjoy it. I don't know about you, but I want to start the doing it. Then I caught the podcasting bug. <laughs> Never looked well, back. It's it is yeah i've been doing this off and on this show since 2016 and uh mm -hmm. i've got another show i do for where you you know it'd be more in tune with our day job it's pr marketing and that kind of thing yeah. uh, and i do that and uh it's great but it does it, i warned you my friend it it can if you it can potentially take over your life especially once you start interviewing guests and things because yeah. um i've got a i'm on this guest service and uh uh, I had to absolutely, uh, I'm, I'm like seven or eight weeks ahead on both shows, and I literally had to turn off the show uh, on there just to say we're no longer accepting guests at the moment because I'm just overwhelmed. And yeah. uh, I, I don't ever want to be rude to someone and just say, you know, no, um, uh, although I do have to... I do have to admit occasionally I have to say no because maybe somebody's means well, but maybe wouldn't necessarily be a great guest. So, but that's yeah. pretty rare. Usually we get some really good folks. And, uh, but I'll, I'll warn you about that if you, if you, uh, go further because right now is, is your show, your show's a, a monthly, right? Yeah. It's just really because it can be a bit tricky recording because my co host, JM Williams, he's based in South Korea. So oh, wow. it's either he's up first thing in the morning or I'm up really late at night or vice versa. So, um, oh my gosh! So you, you can generally tell when you listen um, to some of the episodes that I, they go on for a, some of the longer ones, and about halfway through, you'll notice that my speech starts slowing down a bit. And <laughs> <laughs> I start making less sense. <laughs> As the, uh, you start getting up the early hours of the morning. But <laughs> <laughs> and where can where can people? Find, I assume that's all the usual spaces, right? Uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can find it just about everywhere. Yeah. I mean, one yeah. of the best things about podcasting, it's, it's the tools at, at, at your disposal. I just, they make it so easy. Yeah. Oh, like, we yeah. use Acast and it just, dish, like, as, as soon as you, you, um, you're linked with all like Apple, Spotify, you don't have to do anything. Just upload it to one website and it distributes yeah. it all. So oh, if man. anyone's looking to get podcasting a go, I, I yeah. wouldn't hesitate because it is, it really is. Well, how have you found it? Like the setup and distributing things, how have you found it? Yeah, well, well, because when I start, I start. Of course, I'm very old compared to you, but I started podcasting in 2006, and back mm -hmm. then it was a nightmare to to record it, and and then forget about people carrying a smartphone in their pocket. They had to have a, an iPod, and they yeah. had to go find it and download it, and people didn't understand what it was. I'd be like, it's like a radio show, but it's recorded. Well, yeah. why don't I just listen to it when it's on? I'm like, no, 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 it's recorded. Yeah, but <laughs> why would I want to listen to a recording of a radio show? Because they had it in their mind that recording, that radio is, is live and, and current, yeah. and if you wait, it's boring. And I'm like, no, no, no. So we had all that, and, and all the way just to like interview somebody over the phone. Anyway, I won't bore you with it, but now, oh my word, you're so right, my friend. You just like Acast or Anchor or, or, yeah. or, or there's several of them. You just, you just go and it's so easy to put together. There's really no, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to echo what you just said. I, there's really no excuse if you want to have a show. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, Anchor, the one I've been using for this show, I moved over from Libsyn. It doesn't, I don't even pay hosting fees every month anymore. I, I just, yeah pop it up there and I actually get a little bit of money because uh, I have a little ad for Anchor on there. So I get a little bit of money back, which is nice. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. 
And I think it's a great way to reach other people because not everyone reads anymore. I mean, mm. our lives mm -hmm. are so busy. A lot of people I chat to now, they listen to podcasts when they're doing boring jobs like washing up or driving to work. So you're reaching a whole new audience. And I can't believe, I mean, we've done very little promotional work on the podcast. Mm. And after about a year, it's, it's, it's got like over a thousand followers on Spotify alone. And I don't know how that's happened because <laughs> we haven't really done anything, but just hit, hit, click publish and hope for the best. And right. so <laughs> there's, there's definitely a growing market for podcasts and audio books as well. So if anyone was thinking mm. about going down the audio book route, it's, it can be a little bit of a daunting task. Have you done any audio books before? Right. Right. Well, what, um, I'm looking too at your your shop here on your website, and oh, you yeah. offer some great some great freebies here. I love it. Um, yeah, uh, this wonderful wonderful mug or a beaker. I don't know. What do you what do you call? It? It's a ceramic yeah, mug. I've there you go. Just launched this shop actually in the last few days. Um, I've got um, the mug. Um, yeah, I just I designed the T-shirt. I want the T-shirt. <laughs> That's the one I want. It's a, a right drunk, edit sober, ideally not hungover. That's exactly yeah. right. Uh, <laughs> wow. I'm going to have to save up and get that. That's a great looking shirt. I love it. I've got one of these too on my site for my books and stuff. And I don't sell a ton of it, but it's, I think it's nice. I, I did sell a few mugs the other day to a, who, to a friend who posted it on Twitter and it was lovely to, to see it out there, not in my own yeah. kitchen for once, you know, but, uh, yeah. um, that's really good. Um, so what, what, uh, in the minutes we have left, I'd love to get uh, your take on, on something here. Do you, what about writing, if anything? For you and I, this could be your fiction writing or your day job writing. Okay, yeah. Whatever you want to say, however you want to address it. What What about it is therapeutic for you? I think it is the escape that it gives you from the problems of everyday life. So for that hour, I mean, you can probably apply the same principles to anything, really, like meditation, playing computer games, anything. But for that time, I am not worried about anything else that's going on in my life and. I can really lose myself, particularly when I'm writing fiction. And there are times when I want to sort of try and make sense of what's going on in, in my life and the thoughts swirling around my head. And I can do that by sitting there thinking about how to put that down on paper. And once you start structuring your thoughts in a, a formulaic way and uh, getting it out, sometimes just getting it out of, of of your head is massively yeah. beneficial. It's similar to just like like therapy, just talking about your problems. Instead, you 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 talk, you're having a conversation with yourself. Essentially, you're just getting them out. And I always remember, I was going through a bit of a rough time. This is a good while ago, and I remember I just had this story in my head, and it was related to what was going on. And I wrote it in one sitting, and. I remember like I was at some part of it, I was just crying because it was things that were coming out and oh. it was so beneficial. I just felt like so much better after finishing it that um, I realized that this is, this is just, so this is something that so many people will benefit from. And it's something that I'm trying to encourage more this year. Now I've got the novel out the way. I just want to focus more on encouraging other people to write so I'm planning to launch a writing course called Project Anthology sometime this year, which uh, guides people through the process of putting together a, um, a short story anthology that is designed to teach you every facet of, of storytelling, as well as promoting your book, publishing it yourself and marketing it. So it'll take you through the whole process. And um, I just want to, give people the tools to go off and do the things that they want to love that, that they love to do, which is because writing everyone thinks seem, seem to think that you have to have some sort of qualification, some sort of talent, some skill. You don't <laughs> as long as you've got the enthusiasm to write and share your ideas, your thoughts, your stories, that's all you need. And that's what I'm trying to encourage people. I just want to want them to sort of capture that enthusiasm that you first get when you're writing and try and prevent all these nasty, frustrating things like writing rules, what 10 things that writers, beginner writers always do, just forget about all that. Just focus on the enthusiasm. Here's some tools that'll help you. 
and um, just write for the love of it. That's uh, that is a remarkably uh, kind. And again, you keep saying open hearted, but that's what I that's what I see when I see you and when I hear you talk about things like this way to do this. And I think I've been guilty of being a little overly protective of writing in the sense that uh, here and just, you know, forgive me <clears throat> if I could go off on this for a moment. But yeah. I I just I was, you know, I studied writing. Um, I was a journalist and I've written all these I've written several books and all this. And uh, my only concern. And I want everybody to try to write. I want everybody to do what you yeah. said exactly. But my only concern is I just want to make sure, though, that people, before they hit publish, that that, that it's the best the work can be, that it's edited, yeah. that, it's, that it's professional as possible, because it, it has an unfortunate effect on all of us when people put out stuff that's very enthusiastic. Yeah. Um, but perhaps not the quality level where it could be. And I don't yeah. mean like that doesn't mean like their work could not have quality. It just, some people get so enthusiastic, they go right to Amazon with their first draft and publish mm. it with the cover that looks, you know, pretty bad. Yeah. And, and I just think it hurts us a little bit. Tell me if you think I'm being it snooty. It's fine. Oh, no, no, I, it definitely it saturates the markers, completely yeah. saturates the markers and it creates stigmas then around the likes of self-published right. authors, because everyone thinks that self-published books then are just unedited um rushed to, to to publication whereas it's not like that like so a lot of i know well you have following the trends recently in the, in the publishing world and a lot of selling authors are now being told to to set up like an indie model of, of marketing yeah. themselves right and, um so it just goes to show that as if you've if you're an indie author and you want to go it alone, build a team, get an editor that you, yeah. you trust and that you work well with, an artist who can do all your artwork, and uh, beta readers which you can just develop over time using people who, who follow you or helping other writers out, and vice versa. And it's it's there's a, a lot of work goes into self publishing far more than it does traditional publishing, I think, because they've got the resources and an established team. So it's not fair to stigmatize these quality self-published authors um, just because they decided to go it alone. Um, and the fact that it, the market is so accessible to everybody else can create swathes of, of, le of, of things that just are, haven't had the same level of investment in time and effort. Mm -hmm and money right. i suppose but, um so it definitely does hurt the markets um and i think that's what i try and encourage people to do and what i'm going to in in this project is explain explain to them the importance of doing all these tasks and um and treating it like a, a professional thing because you don't want to release something that you're going to be embarrassed about right or it's, it's going to get criticized it, it, I totally agree. And, and I'm glad you're going to encourage that because we're not trying to discourage people from writing. We're just trying to encourage you to make sure that if you do go it alone, it's the best work you could possibly put out. I call it yeah. the bucket list effect. It, the, the, there's just this bucket list effect where people who are like, I always wanted to write a book. I'll write a book. And yeah. their goal is just to kind of get 150, 200 pages together and upload it with a cover and look, I wrote a book and that's great. Fine. Yeah. Just please, if you're going to do that and you're only going to write one book in your life, why not make it the best damn book you can write? Yeah. Get it edited, get a good cover, right? Yeah, most definitely. No regrets. Yeah. Let me climb off my soapbox now. That's <laughs> the American saying, let me get off my high horse, whatever you want to say yeah. there. I, I just, because my job, because I do, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm right there with you, uh, Richie, is I want to encourage writing. I do. I just want to encourage you to do the best work because don't put out something that in, in a few years you're going to look back on and cringe and go, oh, yeah. why didn't I, you know, why didn't I have a good editor take a pass at that? Or why, why didn't I, why did I do the cover myself? You know, that kind of thing. But anyway, uh, enough of that. <sighs> Richie. What is coming up next for you? Where where do we go? What do we do to see? And I, I assume the, the smart money is on signing up for your email blast, but what's next for you? I uh, At the moment, just focusing on getting some new stories all drafted and written. So I'm working on a lot of fantasy novella, which I've never written a fantasy novella before. So that's something new. And I am moving away from fantasy sort of as well. And... So to going down your route, I love thrillers and I love crime thrillers in particular. So 
I'm writing a sort of I call it a Scouse crime fantasy. So, Scouse, I love it. I love yeah, it. Yes, Scouse crime. So it's a, a, a crime fantasy story set in Liverpool. Um, and I'm having a lot of fun writing that because it's very different to fantasy. I've got all the real world references, so I don't have to build a world. I just have to introduce some sort of fantastical elements to it. And I love my city so so much. And yeah. This is my love letter to Liverpool in a way and the people of Liverpool um, because we just don't give up. No matter the adversity thrown at the place, the people are so resilient and I just want to sort of pay homage to that really because I owe the city a lot for who I am and I'm proud of where I'm from and who I am. So I, I'm, it's my little love letter to Liverpool in a sort of fantastic, fantastical way. I think that's fantastic. And um, I see you're a fan of Ian Rankin. Oh, I love Ian Rankin, yeah. Big, <laughs> big Reavis fan. Oh, man. Well, I was going to say, in that same vein, um, you know, you're talking about the Scouse <laughs> crime fiction here. Um, if you're into Tartan Noir, um, yeah. there's a gentleman I interviewed on this show a year ago. Gosh, it seems like yeah, I mean, he's coming back uh, later this summer. Uh, mm -hmm. Douglas Skelton. And I invite you to check him out. Douglas Skelton. Um, yeah. he, he is really moving up there and Ian Rankin loves him. Ian Rankin's done a blurb nice. for him and said lovely things. So uh, Douglas, if you're listening, yes, again, I am touting your work. Come back on the show. <laughs> but, uh, um, Richie, I need you to do me a favor. I, assuming I haven't run you off, um, when you do have that book, uh, out and ready, would you come back and, and, and let's talk about it? Most definitely. I'll, I'll come back whenever you want me to, Alex. It's been lovely <laughs> chatting with you. Uh, it's been lovely chatting with you. Again, it's richiebilling.com. Don't worry about writing it down. It's in the show notes or go to mgopod.com and you can go there. And when you go to Richie's website, first of all, first stop after you sign up for the newsletter, go to the shop and look at this great mug and t-shirt. You can yeah. also get an autographed copy of Pariah's Lament. All this really cool stuff. And um, uh, Richie, can I just say on behalf of just a, as a fellow writer, thank you for what you're doing to um, encourage a, a new crop of writers and to um, help ensure the professionalism of our craft. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Alex. And thank you as well, because you do everything that I do. And that's why I admire your show and all the work and effort that you put in. So it's, it's great to chat with someone who's of a like mind. And thanks very much again for having me on today. It was absolutely my pleasure, sir. If I haven't mentioned it recently, you know you can get 10% off an autographed John Pilot mystery novel just for signing up for our email list. All you have to do is go to mgopod.com, roll down. Well, you can also do something else. You can click to put a little money in the tip jar, so to speak. You can donate to the show by uh, clicking on the PayPal or PayPal credit link or your other debit or credit card, and you can drop a buck or two in and help support the show. What a great thing to do, but otherwise you can save 10% off an autograph book if you just sign up and subscribe at mgopod.com. Go there, scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll see a box that says subscribe. You get 10% off your first mystery novels purchase when you sign up for our best podcast newsletter. The first time you get an email from us, write back and say, hey, I want my 10% off code. It's that simple. I am Connor Braden, host of the Story of a Storyteller podcast, author of The Longest Night and General Egypt, and you are listening to Serious Goings On. Thanks so much for listening to Mysterious Goings On. Don't forget we have a complete archive of all of our interviews, monologues, updates, live readings, dead readings. All of that stuff is available at mgopod.com. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to us so you never miss an episode. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the usual suspects. Please join us there. Again, don't forget, mgopod.com also has links where to find me on social media and how to get in touch in case you want to be a guest here on the show. Well, I think it's time that I move on for this week, but until next time, keep reading. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, huh? Not quite Mysterious Goings On, listeners. You probably haven't got the brand new Mysterious Goings On official t-shirt. 
This is a quality, quality cotton t-shirt coming in a premium unisex T version and a women's slim fit T version in all the sizes you could possibly need. These are great quality shirts coming in a variety of colors, including dark heather gray, black, charcoal, maroon, and on the women's t-shirt, we come in dark heather gray, black, charcoal, indigo, and midnight navy. There you go. Check them out. They are in the show notes. The link is right there. They're being sold on Bonfire. Uh, they're typically sold in batches, and they'll come at you pretty quickly. All the instructions are on the website. The link is in the show notes here or at mgopod.com. Again, show the world. Well, at least show the world on Zoom or show the world <laughs> when we can finally really get out and about. Show the world that you have some mysterious goings-ons of your own by wearing our t-shirt and help support this show. Thank you so much.